Our conversation today continues an exploration that we began in our last discussion regarding skepticism and Christian faith. Specifically, we've been exploring skepticism and faith regarding the truthfulness of the Apostles' understanding of Jesus. We've been exploring the context of the historical concerns of the Jewish people of Jesus' day as we've walked through our primary text in Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 42. Today we'll be looking specifically at verses 33 through 42. In the course of this study, I've suggested that Acts has established Christian faith on four foundation stones, four cornerstones, if you will. We discussed the first two in the context of Acts chapter 5, verses 27 through 32 last time. The first cornerstone was the historicity of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. And the second was the contemporary witness of the Holy Spirit. Contemporary skeptics often dismiss the first cornerstone as myth, and the second as misinterpreted human perception based not on real events but on subjective interpretations of experiences filtered through complicated mental and physiological innate expectations. Are these valid critiques from the perspective of those who wrote and preserved the Christian scriptures? Well, to re-enter the context of Acts for a moment, I would suggest that Acts does not commend arguments or even our own personal experience to us as evidence. Instead, Acts commends people, and not just any people who claim to have faith, but the apostles of Jesus themselves, the very ones who claim to be eyewitnesses. We'll return to the question of how faithful the New Testament is to the Apostles' witness and teaching a little later in our conversation. But for now, we'll return to Acts chapter 5, this time focusing on verses 33 through 42. And just to resituate ourselves in the context, the Apostles have been brought before the ruling council of Jerusalem, and Peter had just argued that the Apostles could not stop teaching about Jesus for two reasons. First, they were eyewitnesses to the events they were declaring. And second, the Holy Spirit had confirmed that what they were teaching was the very word and will of God. In verses 33 through 42, we find at least two responses of the Jewish ruling council to these claims, and then a recounting of the apostles' successive behavior. The text of Acts says the following, When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up and ordered the men to be put outside for a short time. Then he said to them, Fellow Israelites, consider carefully what you propose to do to these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about four hundred, joined him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and disappeared. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up at the time of the census and got people to follow him. He also perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone, because if this plan or this undertaking is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. In that case, you may even be found fighting against God. They were convinced by him, and when they had called in the apostles, they had them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. As they left the council, they rejoiced that they were considered worthy to suffer dishonor for the sake of the name. And every day in the temple and at home, they did not cease to teach and proclaim Jesus as the Messiah. Gamaliel's response has perplexed some readers of Acts for at least two reasons. First, there is a historical question as to the chronology of the two individuals that Luke reports that Gamaliel used as case in points for his argument. Second, it remains difficult to understand the wisdom in Gamaliel's suggestion here, particularly since we're talking about a Jewish person steeped in Torah. It seems inconsistent with Torah, even as it had been presumably interpreted in the context of the first century, to recommend that people who were accused of being false prophets and leading Israelites astray should simply be allowed to run their course. Even Acts itself reveals that Saul, also known as Paul, one of Gamaliel's students, according to Paul in one of his letters, took a very different approach, actively hunting down and persecuting Christians. The only way that this piece of advice from Gamaliel makes sense to me is if Gamaliel had some question as to the truthfulness of the apostles' claims. 
In other words, it's possible that Gamaliel represented a faction within the Pharisees themselves who were afraid of dismissing the claims about Jesus too quickly. Certainly, that had been the mistake made by the ancient Israelites in the instance of the prophet Jeremiah, for example. Perhaps Gamaliel's comments here were meant to advise patience, attempting to allow some time for the truthfulness of the apostles' claims to be demonstrated. Whatever Gamaliel's reasoning, it forestalled the execution impulses of at least some of the members of the council, and the apostles were merely flogged and released, which might sound like a light thing, which certainly it was not, but it was not death. However we come to understand the nature of Gamaliel's comments here, the book of Acts seems to suggest, in the person of Gamaliel, that the truthfulness of the apostles' claims might yet be demonstrated in a way more convincing to the Jewish leadership than what had already occurred. If Luke has accurately communicated the reality of these events, then the Apostles' testimony and the miraculous activities of the Holy Spirit were not the final or perhaps even the most suggestive indications of the truthfulness of the apostolic claims. What Gamaliel has suggested was that in the recent past false teachings and false prophets were exposed and expunged by the death of the originating person. In other words, once the leader had been killed, the followers had eventually scattered or been wiped out without the need for direct Jewish involvement. If we were assuming a wider Roman and or Gentile context for this advice, it might seem strange, but Gamaliel was a Jewish leader, and these so-called apostles were, for all intents and purposes, Jewish citizens. Gamaliel would not have been, and was not according to Acts, interested in how false religions sprung up in non-Jewish contexts. Jewish movements were based almost entirely to this point in history on a commitment to Torah and a desire to see the nation of Israel re-established. Once a false prophet in that context was demonstrated to be so, the followers had historically moved on. For Gamaliel, there was no reason to believe that this would not be the case with followers of Jesus, unless, of course, they were telling the truth and they actually believed that they had witnessed the resurrection of Jesus as they claimed. But how would one know if they were telling the truth? I'm not sure Gamaliel intended it exactly, but Acts seems to have suggested that the response of the apostles both to the death of Jesus and to the persecution and marginalization they faced from the Jewish community stand as the third and fourth foundation stones of Christian faith. The first foundation stone of Christian faith for Luke is the historicity of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. The second foundation stone is the contemporary witness of the Holy Spirit. Now the third and fourth foundation stones are the response of Jesus' followers to his death and the perseverance of the witnesses in the face of persecution and marginalization. The question for us, as presumably for Gamaliel, remains. Why would a group of Jewish people of the first century make up this story and stick to it in the wake of the death of the one they had formerly believed would be king, who would reclaim the throne of the nation of Israel. Such a tangible expectation seems difficult to hold after the king is dead. Furthermore, why would such a group stick to this story if they indeed invented it, when, by the time of the writing of Acts, it had garnered persecution and excommunication from the majority of Jewish people, it had eventually resulted in the ostracism of Christianity from its Jewish context, it had resulted in harsh persecution from Rome itself, and the original Jewish proponents ultimately, probably even by the time Acts had been written, were being supplanted numerically by Gentile converts. In situations like this, what might the motivation for deception among the religion founders be? Once devotees embrace a deception, the zealousness that ensues is of a different kind. What we're asking here is what would motivate the originators of such a deception, both to invent it in the first place and to stick with it in the face of such consequences. The lack of any substantial evidence of a possible self-serving rationale for deception on the part of the apostles remains compelling for me. Though it is clear that even by the time of Paul there were traveling speakers who were profiting from their gospel presentations, my concern is not with temporary benefits. Most originators of false religions benefit temporarily in some way. Instead, it's the perseverance of the apostles through the death of Jesus, through the persecutions first from the Jewish authorities and then from the Romans, through the loss of their Jewish community and support structure, 
to the rising numerical preeminence of Gentiles among the faithful, to the shift of leadership in the Christian community from the apostles to local community elders, and the list could go on, that for me suggests to a reasonable degree that they believed the truth of what they were declaring. Where is our faith founded? Some have suggested that the truthfulness of the gospel is to be found in the quality of people it produces. Others have argued that the gospel's truthfulness needs to be measured by our contemporary evaluation of its historical reliability, as is revealed through various methods of literary and historical criticism, archaeological finds, and so on. However, Acts seems to suggest faith requires the historicity of the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, which is dependent upon the existential witness of the Holy Spirit, but also on the persistence and even growth of the movement, not before but after its leader's death, and the conduct of the apostles and other witnesses despite persecution and marginalization. Is it an ironclad case? No. There will always remain room for skepticism. In the end, it comes down to trust. And for much of Christian history, that trust was presumed to belong to the church itself. And that proved quite problematic. And the history of interpretation of the church has been plagued with distortion and difficulty. In many historical periods, including the present time in which we are living, our trust in the church has been shaken. Even so, perhaps providentially, our critical ability to validate, more or less, the basic gist of the original apostolic teachings that were developed within two generations of the death of Jesus, has brought us to a point in which our confidence in the ancientness and consistency of the New Testament writings has increased rather than decreased. Fundamentally, the Christian faith has been built upon a presumption of the trustworthiness of those who claim to be eyewitnesses of the events of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, as Acts tells us, beginning with Jesus' baptism and continuing through to his ascension. And admittedly, most of the texts of the New Testament, including the Gospels and Acts, were written some years after the events they chronicle. However, the majority of scholars today have established a timeline of the completion of the texts which comprise our New Testament, with the possible exception of Revelation, no more than 70 years after the death of Jesus. And if it's fair to presume that the lack of reference to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in A.D. 70 in the book of Acts suggests that Acts was written before that event, then Luke-Acts may have been composed only 40 years after the death of Jesus. Ultimately, when it comes to the Gospels and Acts, we do need to trust that the early disciples of the Apostles faithfully transmitted their testimony in the texts we now have. But as I indicated before, we don't have to trust them for very long, namely between 40 and 70 years. Our regard for the First Testament, of course, is so intimately tied to the regard that both Jesus and the Apostles had for it, that even the veracity of the First Testament hinges on our estimation of the inspiration of the Apostles. The Gospels and Acts may raise significant historical questions, and long conversations may be required to wrestle with the marked differences between modern approaches to history and the inspired interpretation of history that we find in the Christian Bible. Even so, for me, if there is a God who revealed himself to a particular people in particular times, and those people and times were far distant from our own, I can hardly imagine what we might have been given to trust, apart from what we presently possess. I have chosen to trust that this testimony is a truthful interpretation of God's activity in history, regardless of the success of history of those who have claimed to embrace it. In the end, the word of the apostles and their most immediate converts may be the only tangible evidence that we have been given. For Acts, and I believe for all who would call themselves Christians afterwards, the first two foundation stones of Christian faith are rooted in a presumption of the trustworthiness of the testimony and teachings of the apostles of Jesus, as they testified to the historicity of Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension, and the reality of the contemporary witness of the Holy Spirit. That trustworthiness can only be established on the people they demonstrated themselves to be, and therefore the final two foundation stones of Christian faith are the response of Jesus' followers to his death, and the perseverance of the witnesses in the face of persecution and marginalization.
This is what we have been given, and to trust this testimony and this interpretation of history is what it means to be Christian. And so the question put to each of us is this. Is this enough for you to choose to trust them?